Hello and welcome to an exclusive hour-long programme with me, Alex Belfield, talking to a genius and a legend and the one and only Des O'Connor. How are you? I don't know what to say after that. I mean, what can I say? I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice meeting you after all these years because, basically, I grew up watching you on TV and everybody has because you've been doing it forever. I think just before John Logie Bird invented it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long while. Uh, I won't joke and say we wore green makeup in those days. No, but I and the first show I did was in 1953, and the odd thing, and I did a series in 58 called Spot the Tune, and then got my first TV series in 63. And you've been stuck with me every year since for 46 years. I think television is a is a it's a microscope, and what you do on there, the viewers can see. They're very discerning, and they can see what's genuine, what's phony. Uh, this guy is relaxed, he's enjoying it, or he's pretending to be. I think it all shows up, so you just have to be yourself. You've always got a twinkle in your eye. That's what I notice about you, whether it's on Countdown or on your chat shows. You seem to enjoy it, and that's infectious. Well, that's a secret, you see, Alex. If, you, if you're not enjoying it, how can you expect them to be enjoying it if you're not? I know you could be the greatest actor in the world, but it would come through as being phony. Though I used to get, not told off, but you say, oh, you do laugh a lot on that couch when we were interviewing all the comics. But... Um, I, I was genuinely, I mean, I didn't say, what are you going to say? There was a time, I have to be honest, say, especially when the American comedians were coming over, we would vet their material and say, well, that won't work, that might work. Yeah, talk about that. But I found later, after about a few years, because it ran for 27 years, but the first first few years, I said, no, just, I don't want to know. If you want to talk to Neil Shan and ask his advice, just let it happen in front of the cameras, which he did. And people watched it. And the lovely thing, Alex, is it was for right across the family, right over them. You could be granny. It could be the kids, and they all got something in that programme. Pop stars, actors, comedians. Nice mix. I think you're also lucky because you had the good years of show business. It seems to me if you were doing it today, there wouldn't be the same calibre of guests. Well, that's true. That's right. And I, I, looking back now, I see it, especially now, I see it as the golden era of television because right through the 70s, 80s, there's all that talent, and there's still the people that were left over from that had learnt their trade in the theatre, which is a big secret. You might think they are two different genres, but they're not. If you can, if you can appeal to a packed house in a theatre, you should be able to do it on television by winding it all back a bit, not pushing, not trying, just being relaxed and, and enjoying it. And I think, it, I think, as we said just now, it comes through. People can see. I was talking to my auntie earlier and I said, I'm going to Des O'Connor's today to do this interview. She said, oh, she said, I used to serve him when he used to come and perform at Butlins. <laughs> Did she really? What, in fire? Up at Filey? No, at Skegness. Oh, was it Skegness? Oh, dearie me. Well, there you go. So give her my best wishes. Well, she said you were a great tipper and that got me thinking as well because you've got to be careful when you're famous, haven't you, that you don't upset anybody because those stories get passed on. Well, that's, well, you know, I wouldn't tip... And, you know, I've never been flash with money, and I've never been tight either. I just think if someone's good and nice and fair, don't do you any harm just to leave a few <laughs> bob or quid, whatever it is, you know. And uh, I do think the old adage of be nice to people on the way up and all that stuff, I just, I never ever thought about that. I just come from a family where you were polite and you were friendly and enjoyed getting paid for doing something you like doing, you know. Is it nice today being here and still being current and able to pick and choose what you're doing? And when people want you on, you can go. Yeah, I mean, for instance, I I'd found myself over the last few years, three, two or three years ago, I was watching that Al Murray and I thought, that guy's clever. You know, he's, he's not, that's not what he, that's an act he's putting on there. You speak to him, he's a very well-educated, well-spoken guy. But he made me laugh and he can think quick. I have one little bit about him. I said, what do you have to swear for, Al? That's just he, he and me, because I have this thing and I don't believe you need to swear. But um, it, no, so I went on there and it was great. And it's what your point you were saying, to be able to choose what you want to do rather than go on anything just to be on the TV. No, I don't need that anymore. And it, the, the having a little bit of being able to select, what it's nice. It is very, very nice. And it's nice to get the invites. All right, we're going to play music from your new album today. You've got this new album out called Inspired, which for me is like Diana Krall and Michael Uble Buble, those kind of artists that just make you go, hmm, it's warm and cuddly, and I love that type of music. Well, I'm, I'm glad you like that album because it, what you just said is what we set out to do is to, to make it feel warm and a little hint of the past, and it's for romantic fools like you, Mr. Belford. <laughs> um, I said, Alan, you know, why don't we try and write those songs you know, the great quality songs. So he, he, he looked, gave me a really weird look. I said, you and I. And I dragged him to the piano and bit by bit got him to, you know, kick around a few notes. We did it together. And suddenly we had a, a, a melody and I said, how about this? I've got an idea for a title. And bit by bit, 
and uh, we found it took us what we didn't rush it over 18 months we'd written uh 20 songs of which 18 are on there and um if Eric Morgan was here now, even Eric Morgan would buy this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually think it's, uh, it is, as I say, it's romantic, but there's a nice little mix of swing in there as well. A little bit of the, of the it's a big band, I mean, and there's not a synthesizer on that album. It's all real instruments and the cream of the crop of musicians in the country. So hopefully uh, it'll do very well. What's the best track on it then? I like, there's a, a track on there I like. Well, they're all good. I mean, some of uh, his writing uh, on Autumn Breeze, the string writing, and that would win an award by itself. It was the best string score ever. But there's a track on there called On a Night Like This, which I particularly like because it's romantic. It's, it's really of that era of the great American songbook. We're back on your favourite local radio station. We're at home with Des O'Connor today. What are you doing letting Riff Raff like me in your house? What am I doing having the pleasure of having Riff Raff <laughs> like you in my house? Well, you know, I, I, what we try and do when, we, when you do something in this business, and let's not hide behind it, you've got to promote it. You've got to, it's no good you having a lovely album and it's on your shelf and nobody else's. And I'm not embarrassed. In fact, people used to say to me, uh, how do you get um, Barbara Streisand on your programme? Because she'd never done a TV show in front of an audience. I said, well, she just happened to have, directed and produced which means putting up the money for, for um, a film called I think it's called The Mirror Has Two Faces and I, I said I can't feel any guilt bringing her all the way from America and she did it for practically nothing in terms of fee because she knew the reward would be that millions of people would know about her movie that's what we're doing here I don't feel too bad about promoting things I'm quite happy and especially when they're good quality stuff now listen we've got a lot to get to so we must stop chit chatting because we've got to talk about your life and your career what were you like as a child adorable <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't walk till I was seven I couldn't walk till I was seven and um you know, I had calipers on the legs, and then but after that, I mean, my mum. Yeah, but then all mums say this. She, she knew. She said, "I know he's going to be a star <laughs> and all that stuff." But uh, I guess had, had Britain's Got Talent been around now, she would have been one of those mums and might have tried to say, "Well, you better go in it." But uh, that's another story. We could talk about that some other time. But um, no, I don't know. I, I wasn't I, because of the the handicap and not being able to walk, and because. It was uh, the war started, and I was, you know, a lot of that was. I didn't really have much education until that, till I was about 11. And then I was evacuated in Northampton town. And from being literally bottom of the bottom class, I ended up being second in the top class three years later. Because I wanted to learn. I knew I'd missed out. And I knew I'd missed out physically because I couldn't walk. And I knew I, because I'd spent half the time in the hospitals and in the air raid shoulders, I didn't have much of an education. So um, I just wanted to learn. And I, I, the other kids used to think I was crackers. I used to want more lessons. <laughs> but it's the only way. Read, learn, you know. So I don't know. I think I'm a fairly normal kid. But um, certainly coming from a family with... A lot of love and a lot of warmth. I know, again, that sounds corny, but it's, it's real. It's interesting as well how you turned your adversity into something positive. A lot of people have become down and negative about it and turned that into some reason to be bitter. You've never, ever been like that, have you? Well, no, because when you got... My dad, would, on my birth certificate, it says uh, scavenger for my father's... Um, occupation scavenger i'm the son of a scavenger and i'm also the son of a char lady so when your dad's a dustman and your mum's a char lady you know anything from then on we didn't have a house we rented room you know and then the rooms we did were renting eventually were hit with a bomb and you're left with a pile of rubble <laughs> there's not much you can do but laugh at it and, and say well it can only get better and if you've got the attitude to you know, whatever I, if, whatever I, I mean, I'm living in a nice home, I've got a nice car now and all that. But even when th times were rough prior, to, you know, in the early days of show business, I was enjoying every minute of it. I've, I've, I have said, and I mean it, I've not done a day's work, W-O-R-K, not a day's work since I came into show business. There's days of effort and a little stress that runs with it, but you learn to deal with that and it's so enjoyable. The only other job I had was in a shoe factory, and show business is better. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't mind me saying, you seem to have the same illness as Bob Monkhouse and Ken Dodd. You come alive when you're on stage. You just want to show off. Well, it may be showing off. It may be. <laughs> I, I, because I'm fairly quiet. My, you know, I think when I go out in the evening, people think, oh, he's going to be all jokey joke. I mean, I could, you can switch it on. And, uh, when Jodie's had a few, that's my wife, when she had a few American and Australian friends over to come out for dinner one day, she said, well, you were doing a performance there practically. I said, no, well, I was just trying to entertain and make them all relax. But um, I think on stage, yeah, there is a feeling of wanting, I can't say to be loved, but I have a, a theory about show business. 
affection lasts much longer than admiration, much longer. And, and that came home with a uh, bang to me years ago in Vegas when I went on one evening to see the dinner show with Sammy Davis Jr. <clears throat> that was about quarter to eight, I think that went on. Then I went to see The Late Show with Dean Martin, which is about 11 o'clock. And I just thought Sammy Davis was sensational. What a talent. What He could do everything. Then I went to see Dean Martin, who could hardly walk on the stage. <laughs> well, he could. He was the kid. He was drunk. <laughs> and I just practically fell in love with the guy. There was such warmth. There was such a feeling. Oh, I really like I wouldn't mind sitting down with that guy and just having a laugh and chatting. Whereas with Sammy, I might have been almost a little bit in awe of him. Mind you, having said that, there's a picture there of he and I on stage. I'll show you. Well, we can't show you that. It's not TV, folks. But trust me, it's there. And um, so I've, I've think that admiration is very important. And I guess I wanted to do that with, with every way, every audience you ever walk out to, this is this is not the same audience as last night or the one you'll get tomorrow. This is these people now who've paid, they've paid, they've got on a bus or a bike or they've walked or the car to come and see you, and you should be better than you are on TV, and you should enjoy it. And that, and if you've got the good help to walk out there and do it, that's something else to be to be thankful for. Have you ever had a crisis of confidence when you've wondered, am I good enough for this? Because you were the biggest star of TV for many, many years, let's face it, and you'd got all these stars coming on your show. Did you ever wonder why you were there? I don't think you can analyse uh, analyze it. You might, I, I used to know at the back of my head, and I'd learnt from other you know, giants of the business like Jack Benny and Bob Hope and people, and I always asked their advice when I met them and talked to them. And, you know, Jack Benny would say to me, just enjoy it, just relax, you know, it's... It's not brain surgery you're doing. You're not saving people's lives, but you're helping people. Just go out and enjoy. You're in a privileged position. And I've enjoyed, you know, I, as I say again, I've been well paid, have a nice home for doing something I would, don't tell anybody, would do for nothing. <laughs> I was only joking there, folks. <laughs> no, but, I, you know, you, you do it because you love it. And um, the actual surgeon doesn't get a standing ovation. And, you, you, you know, the nurses and doctors don't get any of this, and they certainly deserve their round of applause. But um, no, I'm, I'm very lucky, Guy, and I've enjoyed it every step of the way. All right, we'll take another piece of music, and then we'll come back with more from Des O'Connor. We're back on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex Belfield talking to Des O'Connor today. We've got to the bit then where you'd moved to Northampton. When was the point when somebody said, he's a bit funny or a bit different? I don't know whether anybody said it to me. I, I sort of said it to myself because I found that um, I could make people laugh. I didn't know why. I didn't know quite why they were laughing. But um, I remember in, in the shoe factory when I, I worked in, uh, I was uh, they put me in uh, with the, I had got my own secretary and I had to go down to the typing pool and there'd be 18 very attractive young ladies all banging away on a typewriter. I just get them giggling and I just come out thinking, hey, that's good, I made them laugh. I didn't know why, but I was happy about that. And it wasn't flash or, uh, you know, just egotistical. I just felt comfortable that I could make people laugh. And then I would go on the coach trips down to South End with the gang. And again, they would all be expecting me to make them laugh. And you kind of rose to that. So then when I went into the Air Force, I found again I was making people laugh. And I was ordered into a talent contest there by the CO. And then I went to Butlins and I won a talent contest. Then I suddenly thought, I wonder if I really love doing this. I, I wonder, I just wonder if I could do it as a professional. And so um, I, I went and got myself a job at Butlins. That's another long story, but I got in. And then from Butlins, some people saw me, and I started the, the Palace Theatre Newcastle in 1953. So it just happened. I didn't – well, maybe I kind of planned it along the way because I do believe in making – I don't believe the opportunity knocks. I think you have to go and drag it in. You just go, oh, let, let's make something happen. Do you think you've either got it or you ain't? You can't be trained to be you, can you? Well, if we're talking about TV hosts – I think you've got to be relaxed and the people sitting opposite you have got to know you're relaxed and they've got to know he knows what he's saying. So everybody can relax. And the moment the guest relax, relaxes, then it will start to happen and I'll tell you much more than maybe they even intended to tell you. But all, the most important thing of all I find, the ingredient that makes it a conversation, not an interview, a conversation, that makes it, what makes that work is the sound of laughter. When they hear the sound. And when we were doing Desert Mel, I, um, I don't know anyone. Well, they probably wouldn't know. So it was my own little technique. I, I would go towards them before they. Did, I didn't wait for them to come and sit down. I would go towards them, and as we were walking to sit around, say, "Well, where did you get those boots from? Oh my goodness me! <laughs> did you come on a motorbike or, or whatever? <laughs> Silly nonsense!" And they would have a giggle, and they forgot they were 
being interviewed that suddenly they were chipping in and they'd heard the sound of love so you you do learn little things like that and um i think that's vitally important is that's what gets all the other guests to come back and let them talk like you're doing now you're listening you know and you're not sort of uh, interrupting you say you when i'm stopped you're not stopping the news and i think that's also important and to be a host you've got to make the guests look good you could be, be there tomorrow or next week they won't well not not regularly but you can and that's what's interesting about somebody like you. I mean, you've gone through three or four generations of show business and you're still here. That's interesting today because it seems like your time frame is shorter if you're in show business in 2009. Yeah, well, I'm, I won't mention who. There were a few people. Someone was a giant, giant star a few years back. And I wasn't being in any way, uh, it wasn't envy or anything. I just, well, you know, Haley's Comet is the brightest star in the sky, but it's not there long. <laughs> <laughs> so you can burn yourself out. So this is another cliche. It is a marathon. I've never seen it as a sprint. And I wanted to have been it in a long while. And I might be yet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to say really other than just enjoy it. Just take your time. Don't rush it. Because they can sense what's going on out there. The viewers and the audience, they, it's, I think it's called rapport. They either relax with you or they don't. Fortunately with me, they do. I suppose nothing good was made in a rush other than ourselves, really. Oh, well, I don't want to go into that right now. I've got a four-year-old son. <laughs> <laughs> Could you see this house? Am I not, everywhere you look, look, there's a set of drums over there. There are toys over there. And I, all my little things have been pushed aside. So, I'm, I'm, again, I'm very lucky to suddenly have a, I know I'm changing the subject, but suddenly have a, a boy in my life. I've four daughters. I've got four daughters, one who's older than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm very lucky. All right, Des, we're going to come back next and talk about your family and your home and your life today. And I'm going to ask you some advice about can you laugh women into bed? We'll do it next. <laughs> We're back with Des O'Connor. Thanks for talking to us today because you're a huge, great, big, whopping star. Did you know that? Um, I don't know about that, but be, <laughs> let's say I've been around a while. Does it ever become normal when you walk in a restaurant and the staff know who you are before you sit down or you walk in a studio and everybody knows you before you say your name? It's an odd feeling, isn't it? Yeah, I, I once described it as living in a world of no strangers, you know. And But sometimes, it could, well, most of the time, it's fantastic. I remember once driving out from Manchester and the car ran out of petrol uh, and... I, I was on a side road. Well, I'd come off the road because I thought, oh, there's 30 miles to the next petrol station. I've just been told that. Maybe there's a little place open. I'll just come off. And suddenly as I'm going down this little country lane, it went, doo, 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 and it's now run out of petrol. And it ran into, and there was a garage on there. I thought, at least I can park it. So I know it's not stuck in the middle of the, of the road, which was narrow. And I stopped there and I thought, well, maybe, maybe there's somebody living here. So I started through wind, pet little stones up at the window. <laughs> well, who's that down there? What's going on? So I said, look, um, it's not a joke. You're not on TV. You might know me. I'm Des O'Connor. You might see me on TV. I've run out of petrol. I'm just trying to, can, I, can you please let me have a bit of petrol? <laughs> Hang on. A torch came out. I nearly sang. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the next thing I know, I'm in the house. The family have come down. We're having breakfast, <laughs> bacon and eggs. Bacon, it's three o'clock in the morning. Petrol, da, 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 you know. And he, and he even said, oh, it's on the house. Said, no, it's not on the house. You know, the petrol. And so how lucky can you have a job where that would bring that, those kind of perks as well with it? Apart from the warmth and friendship, you know. I had a policeman once who, in, in, in uh, uh, where was it? It was in Los Angeles. and Because they'd seen me on American TV. And he pulled me over and it, it flicked, flicked the gun out of the holster. And it terrified me when you see that in the mirror coming towards you. And because um, I'd, I'd taken the wrong turning or something, one of the, you know, it's all weird, the traffic signs. And then suddenly he spotted me. And you know, five years later, I was still getting Christmas cards from this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Six years later, suddenly it stopped. I don't know why, but it did. But um, so, you know, it, it's marvelous, this job. Uh, and I love it. And I do. We're back to go. the best two hours of any day for me is getting on a stage. Because I don't, I don't ever worry about anyone. There were times when I used to be physically ill in the afternoon thinking about having to perform in the evening. That's right at the beginning of your career. And then comes a the point where you think, hey, I can do this. Not only I can do it, I'm looking forward to it. Not only can I, I'm looking forward to it, but it'll be different tonight. And I'm just as excited as they are. So, you know, it's, 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 I'm doing the right job for me. <laughs> and nobody can catch you out, really. Nothing could go wrong, could it? If the lights went out, you'd still carry on. It happened to me at London Palladium. In, uh, where Lena Horne was top of the bill. And uh, 
uh, suddenly, I remember Arthur Worsley. I'd come off and Arthur Worsley was on trying to do his act. He was a ventriloquist, Arthur, with his little dummy. And suddenly, I went, what's going on? I could, on the, over the tanner, I could hear, that sounds very strange. So I went down to the side and he said, oh, he's in problem. We've got trouble with the mic. And suddenly, everything went black. And he said, uh, oh, it'll be, quick, get out there. Said, yeah, and give me a torch. And, I went, <laughs> and I'm saying to him, right, I said, uh, they're looking for a shilling for the meter. I don't know, all nonsense. And he had to go, he'd have got a hernia trying to, throw, to talk through a dummy with no microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he left and he went. And I'm on there. And Lena Hornwood, and I, I think I did an hour and 30. We were the only, the only show in the West End. The whole of the West End had gone on a parka that stayed open. And, and Leslie McDonnell sent me a crate of champagne at the end of that. And there was one joke I remember doing, which you, I would never have done in today's PC world. But those, are, I remember I said, I would bring Lena Horn out now, but you're having trouble seeing me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, those, those, and she was wonderful. She'd laughed her socks off. So a lot of this PC drives me crackers because whilst I've never been someone that swears on the stage and, and does crudities, I still think they're the odd cheeky thing. The best Irish jokes, Irish jokes I've heard, are told by Irish people. You know, and, and Jewish people laugh at Jewish jokes. I think maybe we all take ourselves just a little too seriously. And of course, talking of humour and jokes, you yourself have been teased over the years, especially by people like Morecambe and Wise. Did that ever bother you? And I used to send my own insults to them. I used to write them. <laughs> no, I, honestly, I did. People would think, they would come to me and say, did you hear what he said about it? And I thought, oh, I can't tell you, I sent him that joke. And I used to say, like, Desert connor has got a one-man show. Let's hope two turn up next time. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, he's, become a limited, no, he's become a limited company, so he should. He's a limited performer. And I used to t- send these jokes to them, and then they would do them on the screen. But when other comics... This is what you were just saying. When other comics started to insult us, okay, it wasn't that funny. It wasn't funny to the public, and I didn't warm to them. You know, I never minded what Eric said about me because I just, we just got on well, and we were chipping each other, having a laugh, and having fun together. But I never ever never went back on TV, and you, know, you don't do that. Not that I not that I wanted to. I just was enjoying it. Looking back now, I think it probably did me one of the biggest favours ever. You know? <laughs> and when was your big break then? When was the moment that you realised, I think I'm going to make it? Uh, I don't know whether it was... I knew from day one. I used to fib to my mum and dad that lived in <laughs> Northampton. We were in Northampton. I used to say, I've got a, a royal show. Oh, have you? When's that? Uh, three years' time. I mean, they didn't know. I mean, throw it. It's a long time. I said, yeah, but, you know, they have to book these things. And then, and then I'd say, I've got a TV series. Wait, Dad, come <laughs> in. Harry, come in. He's got a TV series. Tell your dad. So I've got, when's that, son? Uh, year <laughs> after next. And the rush. Then I'd have to make those lies come true so they weren't lies they were reality they were just <laughs> stretched a bit so i think i've always believed enough in myself to say well one day you know but i don't rush and just get a little bit better and get a little bit better there have been disappointments along the way when i thought i was going to get sunday night like london played him and i didn't get it but you know it's disappointment i kind of use as a, a stepping stone to something else and to, to build that um that thing inside you that says come on you can do this There aren't many stars who make it in America and you're one of the few who were successful. A lot of people go over there and try. They might be on TV for a few weeks, but they're pulled. Um, I noticed on David Letterman, he mentions you at least once every couple of months still. (laughs) And you haven't been on for a while. It's fascinating the impact you made over there. Yeah, well, I was fortunate because um, it it was a two-pronged thing. This I went there uh, to do as an entertainer. And I did that uh, because they'd see me at the London Palladium. Then after, while I was out there doing the interviews for the the show, which went all around the world, it did, it went to 44 countries in the world, that show. Lou, Sir Lou Gray, Lord Lou Gray, now. Uh, he, he could have sold ice lollies to the Eskimos and he was selling all these shows all around the world. So I, uh, I did that. And then when I was doing the promotion for that, we were getting lots of laughs. And my people, were like Cyril Berlin and, and my um, press agent at that time said to me, why are you that funny at home? You're not that funny at home. Why is it you're funny? I said, well, there's no script and there's not a clock I've got to keep my eyes on because to do four minutes of humour, you can't be creative while you're watching the clock and trying to remember the jokes you're going to do. But just to be able to relax like we're doing now, not a word of this rehearsal, I promise you, folks, (laughs) just do it and say it, whatever. That was funny. So when I came back, I wanted to do the talk show. And on that first series was David Letterman, Jay Leno... Gary Shandling and Jerry Seinfeld, all on the who now have bought America. <laughs> but you know, so 
somewhere along the line, and I think it is, I think it's something they say uh, humour doesn't travel. I think somewhere along the line, it's not a case it doesn't travel. Maybe the choice of it is not correct. Or the actual words, you know, pavement becomes sidewalk and chemist becomes pharmacy and things like that. You, uh, you just got to do your homework before you go and speak a little slower and sound just a little bit more English. <laughs> and the Americans, my God, I love that guy. I think he's great. <laughs> so, Why you, though? Why do you think you were the one that was picked and went over there and made such a big success of it? What was the reason? It all had happened about the time at the Palladium. My, my agent, Cyril Berlin, he, told, he said, we've got this boy at the Palladium. You should, you should see him. He's really, really good. So <laughs> this is my agent doing the selling job for me. So... Um, Lou Gray went into the Palladium, saw me, and it was packed. It was packed. It was supposed to be for eight weeks. It ran for 44, you know, and it was packed every night. And so what he had formed in his head, because he'd sold Tom Jones there and Humperdinck, that they were going to sell an entertainer. So he got the craft musical people um, and the agency, which is J. Walter Thompson, to come and see me there. And they like it. They said, yeah, well, will, will, will the rest of America like him? Because America's, you know, it's the North doesn't necessarily like the South. And it's just, anyway, they, they were, Lou Grade then got 40 to 60 people a night coming in for, on freebies to see the show, American tourists, and providing they filled out a form saying did they like or understand <laughs> that guy up there. Fortunately, all this stuff he got in was very positive. They gave me the, 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 the show. And then when I went over there, because at that stage, I'd still been on television a long time in this country, and so I wasn't a kid that didn't know what to do. They liked it, the Americans. It was, it was simple. It wasn't slick and sharp and cute, my God, and all. It was, you know, it was very relaxed and honest. And that's the DVD that I'm bringing up. That's the series that uh, the Americans just absolutely loved out there. We've got a lot of British stars on that. And Liberace. I don't know how you got on that first series. But yeah. So um, all in all, I've, I've been in the right place at the right time and, and got the right results. So I, I, there is a degree of luck, but there's also a degree of knowing what you're doing. All right, we're going to come back next. We'll take another piece of music. And then in our remaining moments, we'll talk about what it's like to be a sex symbol and who are your favourite stars. We're back on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex talking to Des, and that's the good thing about you. You only need to say your first name, and everybody knows who you are. Yeah, well, uh, uh, my mum was very cute, you see. She uh, she didn't call me Elvis, <laughs> but that was a good example. <laughs> but uh, I think when you when they just do say your first name, there's a kind of a warmth about it. Yeah, you know, I get called Dezo in Australia. <laughs> Hello, Dezo, how you doing, mate? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say at least it's half my name, Des O'Connor. <laughs> and of course, we were talking earlier about you being a funny man. And of course, the ladies, I mean, everybody loves you. The ladies just think you're delicious. Can you laugh women into bed? Can I personally, or can it be used? <laughs> what are you asking, young Belfield? <laughs> I, I once said to Les Dawson, because he was the very first interviewee on Des O'Connor tonight. And I said to Les Dawson, I said, now, I have this theory, and it was a similar question to what you just put to me, that humour is a kind of an aphrodisiac and that, uh, you know, it can work with the ladies. And I wonder what he was going to do. And he said, he said, well, let me put it this way. He said, um, I've only ever had one woman outside of marriage. She was a suffragette and she was chained to the railings at the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was less. So I, you know, I th certainly think that humour. I, I won't go so far as to say that it, it it does all the things you say at my, but it certainly helps. To, if you can make people laugh at, at whatever level, whether it's a guy, a gal, a boss, a kid, whatever, it's it's a gift. So you know, I'm fortunate. And of course, comedians are so related to you because you were so passionate about getting them on the telly. And even in the Des and Mel days, you made it your thing to get people like Joe Pasquale on, which was so nice because they just didn't have a place on TV after about 1980, did they? You're very observant, young man. And what the big thrill I got from doing Des O'Connor tonight when people said, because we did have the biggest guests in the world, there were an unbelievable lineup of guests. You name someone, they did it. But when they say, who was your favourite? Because I still say, my best times as host of that show were uh, playing host and, and uh, giving a platform or a spotlight for the comedians. All the big ones we know, you know the Doddies of the world and the normal wisdom, the English ones, the Americans ones, which we've discussed, Bob Hope, Jack Bennett, or everybody. <clears throat> but uh, what I really liked was providing the platform for the young, up-and-coming guys. And there's about, I can name about 20, I'm not going to, but about 20 who made their first mainstream appearance with us? You know, you know Ben Elton and Frank Skinner and Joe Pasquale, Bradley Walsh, Lily Savage, 
well, that's Paul agreed. You know, it goes on and on. Jethro, the widget. It was a great thrill to find these people and put them up there. I have to say to, about Jethro that Jim Davidson marked my card there. He said, there's a guy down in Cornwall. You can go and see him. <laughs> well, I laughed my socks off, except he's a bit blue. And I said, do you have a clean version of this? And then he, <laughs> and he he's just wonderful uh, on TV. If, if you go and see him live, don't take granny. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's brave having comedians on because you never know what they're going to say next. And you seem quite selfless with them, that you're happy to set them up for them to take the glory and get the laugh. I, well, that, we keep going back to Jack Bennett, but he was a giant of his kind. And he said to me, never worry when uh, someone's getting laughs on your show, because people will talk about your show, not that specific laugh. And over the years, I let a lot of people like Jack Douglas, who was a straight man, I used to give him gags and find gags. And other people, I'm, I still do it today. If I'm doing a show, I'll, I'll, I'll let the MD, if I think of a really fun, I'll let him do it. Ray Monk was my musical director. And um, there's a, I don't know, I'm, I'm basically, I want to be a writer. I'm writing all sorts of things at the moment. Uh, and I, it's a joy in hearing a joke you thought of or a gag that fits something. And then get, uh, hearing them getting the laugh, and I, I can get a laugh out of, uh, dare I say anything, <laughs> they, they, we have a conversation with the audience and suddenly we find there's loads of laughs coming. People say, what would you do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> it was a giggle, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm trying to remember it tomorrow, whatever it was. But uh, no, Hugh, um, as I say, giving a platform for those comics was probably the thing I'm most proudest of. Are you a musician? Are you an interviewer? Or are you a comedian? What are you? I went and did a cruise on the QM2. It's a new the new ship. I've done I do occasional gala ones on those boats, and they're great. And the Americans, a lot of Americans, are going, "Well, what are you doing? You were you a comedian, or are you a singer?" <laughs> I said, "Well, uh, because of a guy called Eric Morgan, I can answer that by saying it depends where I am. <laughs> <laughs> because if I'm in America, they think I'm a singer who does some humour." But in England, I'm I'm, an, I'm a comedian who now and again sings. <laughs> but that's been put right. And that's why I'm back to the album again. I'm so proud of that because uh, that even Eric would like that. It's quality. In fact, Joan, his wife, Joan Morecambe, said to me once, and she, I don't think she mind me sharing this with with your listeners. She said, I went into the lounge and he was sitting there with the pipe and his feet up listening to your album. <laughs> I said, oh, how, oh, can you can you say that on the air? She said, no, I'm not going to say it on the air. Said, it's lovely, isn't it? And again, if you look at the figures, you've had 37 albums and you've sold something like 17 million of them. It's 36 and 16 million, but thank you for trying. You're beginning to sound like a PR man. <laughs> 36 albums. And yeah, it's, I don't six, looking up there, the, those three on the end there, those three singles, you know, the, and we're looking, folks, at uh, little uh, discs up here. Those three sold 4.4 million, the singles. I pretend, which was in the charts forever. And I've got one little story. You see the one on the end with no glass in the front of the case. That's Australia. It was a number one album. When it, it, they, they said, we, we're going to send it to you, Des. Oh. So they <laughs> sent it to me, and it had broken. The glass had broken. So my daughter, Samantha, was about seven, six or seven at the time. I said, don't touch that because we're, we're taking all the glass and there might be some bits around the edge. Well, then the phone went. I went to get the phone and she, without me knowing, took it and put it on the, the player. And out came Joan Sutherland's voice. <laughs> all the Aussies had done was spray it. <laughs> Stick a label on it. Send that to Deso. He'll be happy. And I've never put the glass in it. <laughs> There's no greater insult, is there? No, well, it's, oh, she was a good singer, but it sounded like, sounded like a cat with a hernia if it was me, you know, so... Um, I remember when I was asked to go to Las Vegas the first time, um, Helen Reddy, again, Australian singer, said, yeah, he, we'll have him on the bill as much support. You should do the first 45, minute, first 45 minutes of the show. Yeah, I'll have him on the bill. She said, but um, he, I don't want him singing. So we said, no. So then Checky Green, an American comedian, wonderful American comedian, he said, sure, you can come on a show, but uh, just singing, no jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and this was going on. Then I got booked with the Carpenters, and then sadly Karen Carpenter was taken ill. But two or three years later, I went on there, Nelson Riddle and his orchestra. Oh, that, I got to sing, I got you under my skin. And Nelson Riddle at the end of it said to me, better than the other guy, Des. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Mr. Sonata would be thrilled to hear that. No, it's been, it's been a good ride so far. It hasn't finished yet. And some very, very quick questions. Where's your favourite venue so far? Well, it has to be the Palladium because, you know, I've got, again, there's a plaque up there. And <laughs> I showed you the date on it. It does say 1,000th performance at the London Palladium. 1,000th <laughs> solo performance. Not in a show, solo performance. And that's dated December the 5th, 1972. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I must be older than Methuselah. But I've, I've been there so many times. It's a wonderful. It's great to play the MGM Grand in Vegas. It's great to play the Opera House at Sydney, the O'Keefe Centre in Toronto, and I'm big in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> <laughs> And your life now, of course, is just brilliant. You've got your daughters and your new son, who you're just so proud of, and your house is full of him, isn't it? Oh, yeah, everywhere, every room. There's, we used to have wallpaper. Now we've got little it's this <laughs> Adam's Academy, Art Academy. And as you can see, there's a set of drums there. There's a piano here, which he's had a piano lesson this morning. He sings fantastic. He dances. His mother's a wonderful singer, Jody. Jody. You often, because I'm, I'm, you know, not a kid anymore, and you think, I just hope I'm around long enough. But then I look at... To, to see him grow up and see the things I think he can and possibly will achieve. But um, I'd just like to be there to advise him and be a dad. I was playing football with him at the weekend, playing, literally kicking around. Cause they, they used to say, oh, but I, they forget my dad lived to be 95 and I've always been an athlete and um, happily, you know, I, I look at that. The, when they put my age by my name, I go, that can't be me. <laughs> That's not me. Um, you know, it's just a number in the passport. It doesn't mean a thing. You know, so all in all, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying it and enjoying the challenge of, you know, suddenly, the, even this year, like June 22nd, I've got a new DVD, I've got a new album, I've got a concert tour coming up. I'm coming your way, folks, watch out. <laughs> Bring granny, I don't swear. <laughs> <laughs> and will you ever get bored of it? Because it seems like you're going to go on forever because you don't need to do it for financial reasons and ego, well, that's all been sorted by your CV. It is just because you just love it. Oh, yeah, it's the biggest thrill on earth. I mean, for me to be, I can't think of anything that I would enjoy more than, in, uh, you know, and there's a packed house and, and here in the buzz of it over the tannoy, you know, and, uh, and walking out there and then they've come to see you. Just, I mean, I don't have an announcement. M remember the first time I did it, my agent said, but nobody did an announcement. I said, look, that lot come to see me and if they don't know it's me, I've got a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> One of them's just walked in. <laughs> it's my wife, it's Alex Belfer. I was just telling him you've got an album out. Yes, I do. What shall we do? Shall we end with a track from your good lady wife yeah. or play one of yours? Uh, well, she's standing there now, so I've, I've got to say play her, play, play both. <laughs> or I would do that. The last track on the album is called In My Life, and it really seems to sum up your journey through life and show business. It's a very touching song. Yeah, well, we, we did um, most of the tracks, and we... It suddenly had this thought in my head, and then I think it was uh, um, Alan who said, "You should do something like a my way." You know, you should do so. I said, "Oh, it's a bit. I don't want to wave flags and have the people. Oh, what a great guy he is!" And so, well, let's. So he came up with this beautiful melody, and um, we started. And he actually came up with a few lines that he'd written in another song sometime. And I said, "Well, let me have that. Let me go where." And we worked at it together, and we've ended up with this song. And it, it is. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a reflection of what happened. There's a line in there that says there, there were times in the uh, in the words I had to sing, and I was close to tears. And without, because I don't dwell on those things. They come and they go, and you get on with it. Whatever else is happening in your life, but uh, it was it's it, it's an interesting song, and it takes an intelligent man to to realise that, Alex. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I am. That's the thing you've realised. I'm glad you have. And of course, bring back Desamel. That's the big thing on the end of this interview. I'd love that because, well, she's just, we just laugh our socks off. I mean, from the very first moment I met her when she fell down the stairs and then ended up in my arm, <laughs> literally, I said, oh, well, you have fell for me. That's the starters. <clears throat> um, she, we've been around, we have what we call a biannual dinner. Twice a year we go out for dinner. And every time we've been told, can you keep that down? And, I, and I, we will never stop laughing. This is true. I heard someone say... Um, we were laughing so much, and I uh, heard uh, the way to say, what, what will you have? And this guy said, I'll have what they're having. <laughs> it was just like Harry, Harry, was it when Harry met uh, Sally, what it was. But um, I would love that to come back because it was genuinely, honestly, completely genuinely spontaneous. There was no script. We didn't have a script. You'd have to have lines which was leading in and out of certain things. But um, And we would kind of get a pattern for an interview. But when... The two of us just sat there and waffled on the papers that came up. Some of the things she used to say, we call them Mel's moments, which <laughs> when it's live, you, it's gone. You know, and I think the public knew we were laughing and they didn't mind if it was a little bit cheeky now and again because they knew it had happened. We didn't plan it. It had just slipped out. Well, it wasn't so much what she said. It was the way you took it. Well, I, she used to say things. I mean, <laughs> I, I won't tell you now the sort of, because, you know, I, as I say, that, that 
the public will wear it if and, and, and laugh with it if they know that it kind of happened. If I did it now, I'm doing it for effect. But she would say things and I'd look at it and I couldn't believe she'd act. It's a bit like my wife Jody actually will say things and, and <laughs> you know, you just start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Des, thank you very much for talking to me. I really appreciate it because you are one of the biggest stars ever in the world and there aren't many of those left. And the fact that you still love it and you're doing it for no other reason that you just love to do it is so inspiring. Thank you very much. I'm very fortunate. Thank you for all those kind compliments. Thanks, Alex.